Okay, let me see if I can get something done today. Both sides of the story. When I returned to my chambers, I could already hear, hear Delia inside yelling, Jeez! One when I looked at each other. Delia had generally been in such a good mood since Dirk had come along that neither of us had heard her, there, heard her this hysteric in a while. I see you can hear Delia too. I wonder what happened. Let's hurry back, Apprentice. Daniel prompted with a guarded expression. I power walked as fast as I could to my chambers, where I found Fran and Delia arguing. The high priest can't be trusted. He is trustworthy. Yes, he is trustworthy, actually. He does have mine's best interest at heart. It seemed less like an argument and more like Delia gnashing her teeth at him. But still, it was a rare combination to see. I couldn't help but blink in surprise. Fran, Delia, what is going on, I asked, said. It seemed neither of them had noticed me before then as Fran's eyes opened wide. He hurriedly apologized, welcoming me inside. Welcome back, Sister Mine. I apologize for my unsightly behavior. In contrast to Fran, who had quickly composed himself, Delia ran over and gave me a sharp glare, yelling, Sister Mine, what's the meaning of this? I had no idea what she was referring to. Um, uh, whatever are you talking about? Delia, you must not speak to your mistress like that, Fran rebuked. But, Stan but Delia just lightly gripped my shoulder, tightly gripped my shoulders. I'm asking what all this business about having dirt be adopted is about. As I've repeated many times, Delia, Arnold said that the idea has already been rejected. Let go of Sister Mine. Fran detached Delia's hands from me without letting his comic exterior falter, but I still had no idea what was going on. <coughs> I was completely out of the loop. Could someone please explain? It seemed that I wasn't the only one at a loss here. Wilma was also blinking in surprise at Fran and Delia's behavior. Um, what am I supposed to do in situations like this again? Right, right. I need to listen to get both sides of the story. Recalling what the high priest had told me before, I was able to get a handle on the situation just a little better. I looked around and first spoke to Wilma. Wilma, thank you for walking me back. You may return now. If you stay here until I have listened to them both, problems may arise in the orphanage. As you wish, replied Wilma, but she turned back to look at Fran and Delia several times on her way out of my chambers. Sister mine, I will listen to you both on the second floor, Delia, so for now, just prepare some tea. I climbed the stairs with Fran, hoping on some level that Delia would calm down during the process of boiling water and carefully making tea. On the second floor, we found Rosina, who was sitting in front of a heart spill with a sleepy look on her face. We made eye contact, and she, while wavering a bit, she stood up to greet me. Welcome back, Sister Mine. Rosina, do you not know what do you know what happened? No, Delia woke me up, but I did not listen for the details. It seemed that Delia's shouting had woken her up during her afternoon nap. Rosina, speaking less eloquently than usual, was making her displeasure apparent, even if it didn't show on her face. You may return to your room a little to rest a little more, Rosina. I believe I will. Rosina swayed as she returned to her room. Well, she was sleep deprived. <laughs> Sounds like she's going to fall over any minute. That's not good. I sat down in the chair Fran had pulled back from me and decided to hear his side of the story first. Sorry, but I couldn't understand a word of what you two were saying. Could you explain the circumstances, Fran? On her way back from the orphanage, Delia bumped into Arno, who was carrying a message from the high priest, and the two of them came here. I was in the middle of my rest, but Delia called for me, and I got dressed at once to meet with them. It seemed that not only had he been forced awake during his nap like Rosina, but he had been pushed into meeting with Arno and listening to Delia's angry ranting at the same time. Had I been there, I could have dealt with Arno on my own. I apologize for my absence. It's nothing to worry about, Fran said with a dismissive shake of his head. Even when you are here, I would like for you to call me when Arno visits. It seemed he felt the need to hear any messages from the high priest whether I was there or not. Furthermore, if Arno had truly only been here to pass on a message... This would not have been a problem at all. I did not expect Delia to explode with anger like that. <coughs> Fran glanced toward the kitchen inside. His frustration was clear on his face, which was rare for him. That told me more than enough about how harsh Delia had been. What was Arnold's message then? That the high priest did look for someone to adopt Dirk, but that the search was as difficult as expected. According to Fran, the high priest had been looking for someone to adopt Dirk, just like I, just like I had first asked him to. Arnold came to tell us that although they hadn't found anybody, it would be best for me to keep my spirits up and continue raising him in the orphanage. I had pretty much given up on the adoption when the high priestess said that baby boys were rarely, if ever, adopted. Instead, switching my focus to signing a contract with Dirk when I myself was adopted by a noble. To be honest, I had almost entirely forgotten about asking the high priest to search for someone to adopt Dirk. Wow, now that's what I call integrity. I was impressed after hearing Fran's explanation, but Delia had just come up with a tea, and hearing that had reignited her wrath. She set the cups down in front of my me rather hard, and then glared at Fran. <sighs> Why would the high priest of all people be talking about someone adopting Dirk? 
Judging from her, Fran's explanation, he th neither he nor Arno knew that Dirk had the devouring. As it stood, Delia's wrath was entirely focused on the point that people have been talking about Dirk being adopted outside of her knowledge. I lowered my eyes. The high priest told me to hide that dear Akatha devouring. How could I explain to Delia that we have been searching for someone to take him in and save him from his own mana? The high priest must have made a hobby of ripping families apart. First he did so with Sister Mine, and now he's trying to do the same thing with me and Dirk. How many times have I said that the high priest would never take joy in this? He must have his own reasoning. It seemed that Delia, in Delia's head, the high priest was a villain who ripped apart families whenever he got the chance. One could hardly blame Fran for getting a little angry when someone he respected was being badmouthed like that. Oh yeah. I don't blame him. Delia, I accent slowly, like I was taking deep breaths, then looked at her. There are no gray shrine maidens here equipped to raise a child. Would y'all shut up? God. To that end, I asked the high priest to look for someone who may wish to adopt him, so I thought he may be happier that way. Delia's anger turned straight toward me. What? You wanted to tear us apart, sister mine? I shook my head and corrected her. No, you didn't even want to look after Dirk at first, remember? I didn't think anybody would want to. Delia seemed to at least remember what she had said back then. Her eyes opened wide and she faltered a little. Well, that was only when he had just arrived. Yes, and it was when he had just arrived that I had consulted the high priest. Delia fell silent, her anger cooling down. There are no gray shrine maidens who have raised babies before, and none of us knew how best to look after him. There are no wet nurses who would be willing to visit the temple. Fran and Rosina are barely getting any sleep due to having to watch over him at night. And ultimately, I thought someone adopting him might be the best solution to everyone's problems. As it was now, Fran and Rosina were at least taking naps during the day, and Delia was watching over him more than she said she would. But for those few first few desperate days, Dirk really had been an immense burden on everyone. Delia remembered that, so, so while she did give me an unsatisfied pout, she just grumbled without saying anything. I requested that the high priest look for someone to adopt Dirk, and he diligently did so. I didn't have much hope since he had told me from the start that he would be unlikely to find anyone, but he nevertheless looked to the best of his ability. Oh, I see. I understand now. Delia said with a nod, her tense shoulders loosening up. I did not expect you to look after Dirk as eagerly as you have been. Now I am glad that no one was found to adopt him. Arno did say that we should continue raising him in the orphanage, did he not? He did. The high priest said to keep our spirits up and do our best raising him, Fran added, which made Delia blink in surprise for a minute. She then peered at me as if wanting to remove the last trace of doubt that still remained in her mind. So you won't rip me and dig apart Dirk? <laughs> me and Dirk apart, sister mine. Of course not. I know how much you care for Dirk, Delia, and I know all too well the pain of being separated from one's family. Thank goodness. Delia pressed a hand to her chest in sight of relief. I never want to let Dirk go. He's the only, the only family I've ever had. Ten days later, Johan had finished making the iron. It was the first thing he had completed out of everything I had ordered. Perhaps because it was the simplest to make, or maybe because it, it stimulated his creative mind the most. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks to the timing, I decided to try strengthening the stencils with wax before we started printing for the second picture book. The wax being a little thick wouldn't matter given that we weren't using a file yet. We should be able to print lo loads more using this. I proudly puffed out my chest. The wax strengthening stencil. Wax strengthened stencil wears. Lutz just crops his arms and cocked his head. Hey, mine. Didn't the high priest say not to print too much? Isn't printing loads more really a good idea? <sighs> Waxing the paper will let us reuse the stencils, which means we can print over a longer period of time. Don't dodge the question, Lutz yelled, but I had no intention of giving out my picture book stencils. I would eventually be using movable type printing for text-heavy books, but illustrations had to be remade. This is to lessen the load on Wilma. Isn't being able to reuse stencils just better in every way? <sighs> Lutz, knowing how much work it was for Wilma to draw the art, then cut out the tiny blinds, grimaced, and rubbed his forehead. Just the art, sten just the art stencils, all right? I waxed excess exclusively the art stencils, which I then gave to Gil. All the printing was now done by him and the Grey Priest in the mine workshop. Let's had a little more time on his hands thanks to Gil taking care of workshop business, and as a result, Let's, Samuel, and I were able to spend our days alternating between going to the workshop and Gilbert and Company and going to the temple. The Italian restaurant was close to beginning being done. Its stores and window sales in the process of being installed, so I was actually pretty busy going there with Benno and visual visiting the ink workshop to record research results from Heidi, among other things. Mine, why'd you fall silent? Thinking of something? Uh... Huh, Camille. Again? Despite my busyness, 
My mind was always dominated by thoughts of making toys for Kamiya. According to reports from the orphanage, Dirk loved the wooden rattle I made, but whenever he tried to hold it himself, he'd drop it on his face and start crying. Well, he's a little baby. He's not going to be able to hold it himself just yet. I felt bad thinking about a toy falling on Kamiya's cute face and hurting him, so if possible, I wanted to make something that would be less painful. Let's. I think I wanted some little bells. What for? I can use them to make a rattle small enough to squeeze. There were a lot of bells and other metal objects that made noise here, but I hadn't seen any that looked like cat bells, the tiny round bells you might find on an animal collar. It might be hard to get them to make a pretty sound, but the design itself was simple enough that Johan could probably make them if asked. Okay, let's go to the smithy. The smithy wasn't far from the ink workshop, and I eagerly started making my way there. Morning. Welcome, welcome. Hey, Gutenberg, Lady Mine's here. A smith who I had never seen before turned and casually shouted for Gutenberg without even a flicker of a smile on his face. Apparently they had gotten so used to their name that it wasn't even a joke anymore. Johan came to the front of the workshop and weakly muttered for the smith not to call him Gutenberg, but was very casually ignored. I think he's kind of given up on telling them to stop because he knows he's not, they're not going to stop. Lady Mine, what brings you here today? I haven't finished the styluses yet. I had actually ordered a wide range of different styluses for writing on the wax paper, which meant the job would take him longer to finish. Well, you could actually have some apprentices do this work instead, but I want some bells like these. Apprentices do this work instead, but I want some bells like these. I started drawing the schematics for the cat bells, which Johan peered at with great interest. As expected, he had only ever made larger, more traditionally shaped bells, never small and round ones. Lady Mine, are these notches just for decoration? They're important for producing the right sound. The notches don't need to look exactly like this, but please don't exclude them either. They need to be narrow enough that the bell balls inside won't fall out. Bells would apparently make different sounds depending on the size of the notches, the thickness of the metal, the size of the balls, and the materials used. But I didn't remember the details for all of these. All that. All I knew was that if you put metal balls instead of a larger metal ball, it would make a noise when shaken. Once they were ready, I'd have him put the smaller cat bells into a layer, larger metal, sh metal shell. There needed to be two layers so that the noise would still be audible when put into a stuffed animal. Yeah, they won't be too hard to make. Are these for printing too? No, I want to use these for baby toys. Even I order things unrelated to printing sometimes, I said with pursed lips. Johan beamed a wide grin. Hey, this is the first time you've ordered something unrelated to books or printing. I thought books were the only thing you cared about, he said, a clear sense of relief in his voice. Right now, my head was full of Kamio, but in general, I only cared about books. That said, I didn't feel the need to correct his misunderstanding. He could be happy while it lasted. Or so I thought, but let's went ahead and shot him down. You were right. Mine only cares about books. If you think you can escape your fate as a Gutenberg, you've got another thing coming. I know that. Can't you at least let me have a little hope? Johan said with an exaggerated groan. Let's slapped his back and said he needed to get used to me as soon as possible, which was the nail in his coffin. Yep, and let's, don't forget, you're my oldest, most respectable Gutenberg, I said, which for some reason made him slip over just as sadly as Johan. Why? I was just trying to give him a compliment. So strange. <laughs> oh, those guys. Poor them. I'll just be going straight home today, I said to Daniel after leaving the smithy. But at that moment, the chime of bells sounded out right through the city. Bells signaling an emergency. Seconds later, a red light shot into the sky from the east gate. It was someone calling for aid using a magic tool. As a knight, Daniel was the first to react. He glared at the red light by the east gate with a hard expression while picking me up on the spot. Let, let's go. That was all he said before running straight to my home. He had advanced down the roads and through side alleys with confidence, having possibly memorized them all while following me around the lower city. Lutz was running close behind him, all the while despite blinking in utter confusion. I know the roads by now, Lutz. You can go home or to your store, whichever works. Daniel said, still running. He's... Normally dropped me off at the well in the plaza, but this time he raced up the stairs of me in his arms before wrapping a firm, wrapping a fist against her front door. Yes, who is it? Mine? Mom stepped aside to let Daniel in, who quickly set me down. Mom blinked in surprise as he, looked, as he looked between me and her, a hard expression on his face. Something happened at the East Gate that made them call for the help of the Knights Order. The East Gate? It was a thin light, not a thick one, so I would guess it isn't anything violent. They just likely just need us Knights to make a firm decision on some noble matter. That said, I will remain here until the apprentice's safety is concerned. Is the cured. Mom was stunned by the sudden visit from a knight, but she grasped the circumstances and nodded quickly. Please keep mine safe. Daniel stood by the front door so that he was ready to react on the spot if something happened. Kamil had started crying, so Mom went into the bedroom while I got Daniel a glass of water since he was a little out of breath. Ah, thank you, apprentice. 
Daniel gulped the contents of the cup down in one go, then took a few deep breaths to collect himself. I knew I would just be in his way if I stuck around any longer, so I went to the storage room. I wanted to know what cloth we had for the stuffed animal rattle I wanted to make. There's a lot of white, so maybe I'll make a rabbit? After finding some cloth that felt nice, I started getting to work on making stencils at the kitchen table. All of a sudden, a white bird like the magic ones I had seen before faced the wall and came flying and flying this way. It surprised the heck out of me popping out of nowhere like that. But Daniel just casually extended his arm toward it. The bird settled on it and opened its mouth. Daniel, after delivering the apprentice shrine made into the temple or her home, regrouped with the knight's order. The bird represented, repeated the order three times in a low, gravelly male voice before crumbling and turning into a yellow face stone. Daniel made his gleaming wand appear from something somewhere like the high priest usually did and tapped the stone while chanting something. Whatever he did made it turn back into a white bird. The apprentice shrine made it is safe at home. I will return at once, he said, before waving his wand. The bird flew through the wall and disappeared. Apprentice, I'll be regrouping with the knight's order to get briefed on the situation. Under no circumstances should you leave the house before I return. Understood? Understood. After emphasizing that I wasn't even to go outside to the plaza, Daniel left. I had no idea what kind of emergency it was, but if he was being called away to regroup with the knight's order, it probably had something to do with me. Maybe. Mind, did the knight just leave? Mom, having finished feeding Kamiel, came out of the bedroom wearing an uneasy expression. It seemed she had found comfort in Daniel at night being here with us. At the moment, there was only me, Mom, and Kamiel still inside. Nobody would be able to act if something happened. He was summoned back by someone in the Knight's Order. If they don't think Sir Daniel needs to stay here with me, then they think I'll be safe. Which means it's either already over or nothing too serious, I explained. Mom gave a firm nod, a faint smile looking just a little relieved. Oh, he left because it's over. That's a relief. In the end, we didn't even have to wait for Daniel to get back with an explanation, since Dad came home with one first. He had started working in the East Gate in spring and had been at the center of today's ruckus. Dad, what in the world happened over there? Yeah, I guess I should tell you about it, mine. After dinner, Dad explained what happened while slowly slipping away at his beer. A noble from another duchy kicked up a fuss when trying to enter the city. The emergency incident had been an outsider noble trying to force their way in. Just like the high priest had told us before, the rules regarding nobles entering and leaving the city had been changed in the spring. And one of those rules was that nobles from other duchies couldn't enter the city without the Archduke's permission. The letters of introduction that had been customary up until now would no longer be accepted. The nobles of Ehrenfest knew this since they had heard it directly from the Archduke during the winter gathering. But nobles from other duchies didn't know the rules had changed. The result was a noble getting blocked at the gate by a commoner guard and ultimately exploding with anger. The higher-ups must have predicted something like this would happen. They had everything ready for the Knight's Order to move in if any nobles started causing problems at the gate. Wow. The Archduke sure thought things out, huh? Apparently, he had been Dad himself who had used the emergency magic tool given to the gate by the Knight's Order to call for help. It was composed of two pieces, a hammer-shaped tool with a red stone inside, and a second, second separate red stone. To make the beam of light shoot up into the air, all one had to do was strike the second stone using the hammer-shaped tool. The one Fran had used in the carriage back during spring prayer was probably the same, of the same kind. Nobles could act however they wanted the commoners, but when nobles of the city were involved, those from other duchies were at a disadvantage. The outsider noble had pro apparently left grumbling after the knight's order had explained that he would need the archduke's permission to enter. Problems caused by nobles are best solved by nobles. Honestly, I'm real glad they came to help. Still, he had a letter of introduction from a noble here, right? Why did someone send him a letter of introduction if they knew he wouldn't be able to enter without the archduke's permission? Who knows? Maybe it was someone who maybe the person who sent the letter was it, you know, a noble that had, you know, graduated from the Royal Academy and thus hadn't heard it from the Archduke? I don't know. I, I actually know who sent it, to be honest. But I'm trying to act like I don't. Maybe it was the letter of introduction he had been given before the spring? I tilted my head in confusion, despite the answer feeling being impossible for me to know when Dad looked at me with a serious exp expression. Mind, you need to be real careful about staying safe. Remember what the high priest said. Nobles from other duchies might be coming after you, he warned, and I gave a slow nod. I'll protect the gate and call the Knight's Order the second any dangerous noble tries getting in. You just be sure not to go anywhere without your bodyguard. Dad, promising to protect me made me so happy that despite the circumstances, <coughs> I couldn't help but smile. The two who left. Daniel didn't come the next day or the day after that. Since I wasn't even allowed to go to the plaza, I had nothing but spare time, which I spent thinking up the contents from my third picture book and making stuffed animal, tr stuffed animal rattles with, with Tuli. She was apparently going to give the one she had made to Karina's daughter 
Rena, Renee, whatever. I'll bring it when we go to her place to see the baby. We are going to see her, right? It would be a bit awkward if we didn't go, given how much the Gilberta Company has helped us. Not to mention that Benno gave us a gift when Kamiya was born. My plan was to visit Karina once all the danger in the air had settled down, and Tuli was more than ready to come with me. Gil girl babies weren't prob were probably cute, pretty cute, too. Plus, I was kind of looking forward to seeing Otto going head over heels for his new daughter. But look, the one you made is cuter, mine. Tuli looked down at the finished rattles and pursed her lips. She had made a white bear-like thing, which I made something more similar to a rabbit. They were kind of lumpy since we had stuffed the white cloth with rags instead of cotton. Your sewing is way better than mine, though. I had stitched mine together a little haphazardly, but like Tuli said, it was still pretty cute. As I sat looking at my successful work and satisfaction, Tuli peered over bes from beside me and shook her head. If you don't learn to sew a little better, you'll never get married. That's fine. I'm prepared to dedicate my whole life to books. What men look for in wives around here with good health, being able to work, and having good sewing skills. I didn't, need a, I didn't meet a single one of those criteria. So my fate was sealed. I had given up on marriage a long time ago. Just like in my Arano days, I would be just fine living with books as my soulmates. <laughs> uh, considering you're about to mana girl, you're probably going to end up in a political marriage no matter what. Here's hoping that you find someone who is actually a good person that you actually like. I say like, as in someone you're comfortable with, not I doubt it's going to be love. Unless something happens, but whatever. And to be honest, I would rather much, much rather keep making and reading books than be married off to someone and have to spend my days wrestling with threads to make clothes for my new family. If only we had the cat bells to finish these toys, I sadly thought to myself, but on the evening of my third day in isolation, let's came over with them. Johan brought these to, things to the store. What do you need them for, he asked, rolling a few around in his palm. They let out a cute little tinkling sound as the smaller bells inside knocked into each other. Wow, Johan knocks us out of the park yet again. They're little bells, and I'm putting them in these toys. That way they'll make noise when you shake them. And they don't hurt you. The cat bells had to go inside the toys so that small children wouldn't accidentally swallow them, and the eyes and mouth were just past patterned cloth rather than separate parts that could be taken off. I had kept a small slit open on each toy so that I could put the bells in, allowing me to quickly complete them in front of Lutz. I shook the finished toys, and a cute clinking sound could be heard from inside the cloth. Be cloth. Success! Kamiel, it's done! Can you hear the bells? I tried shaking my rabbit next to Kamiel's ears, and he blinked in surprise several times. He couldn't hold up his head yet, which meant he couldn't turn to look at the toy. But his eyes were searching for the source of the noise. Cute, you're so cute, Kamiel. I broke into a smile at his reaction to our toy, or to my toy, and seconds later he started crying. It seems my road to becoming a beloved sis older sister was far from over. In the end, it was on the morning of my fifth day of being stuck inside that Fran and Daniel came to pick me up at my house. Good morning, sister mine. Good morning, Fran, Sir Damiel. Morning, apprentice. Damiel nodded in response to my greeting before turning to look at Dad, who was still at home since his work didn't start until the afternoon today. If you'll excuse me, I'm here for the apprentice. Please take good care of her, sir. Dad thumped a fist twice against his chest in salute. Damiel responded in kind, a serious look on his face as he spoke again. Gunter, I have a message from Lord Ferdinand. The Archduke is presently visiting the Sovereignty and will not be around to grant any entry permits in the city. Or entry, any entry permits in the near future. You may be shown fake permits, so take care not to accept any as valid. Understood? Sir, yes, sir. Dad gave a firm nod, had hard look in his face. He is, was always so cool when he was doing his job. Okay, bye everyone. Be careful. We met up with Lutz in the plaza and headed to the temple. I could see Fran's expression darken as we got closer. Fran, what's wrong? Your brow is furrowed. I will explain in a moment. It's not something to talk about in transit, he said before closing his mouth into a bitter expression. You will know once we arrive at the temple, whether you want to or not, Daniel added. I looked up at him and saw that he was wearing his usual noblesse smile that held, hid all emotion and conveyed absolutely nothing. All right, well, I'm off to the forest, said Lutz. Okay, bye-bye. We split up with Lutz in front of the workshop like usual before heading to my chambers. I waited like a proper lady from Fran to open the door for me, but the atmosphere when I went inside felt so different I couldn't help but blink in surprise. It certainly is quiet in here. It was almost uncomfortably quiet. I could, would normally be able to hear Dirk crying or Delia playing with him or the sounds of several people moving around, but today there was nothing. It was so quiet, in fact, that I could hear the chefs working in the kitchen all the way at the front. Dirk must be asleep, I thought to myself while climbing the stairs as silently as possible. When I reached the top, I found Rosina wiping down the table. That actually worried me since Rosina only, usually only played music and did paperwork, so as to not hurt her fingers. It was almost Delia who did minor chores like that. Good morning, Rosina. Where is Delia? Is she feeling sick? 
I asked, looking around. Rosina lowered her eyes, then put down the cloth she was using and headed for the closet. Delia is no longer with us. She took Dirk and returned to the High Bishop. What? The news came so suddenly that I couldn't even process it at first. I looked up at Rosina, confused, and with my robes in hand, she searched for the for she searched for words before giving a sad smile. Sister mine, let us get you changed before we talk. Fran, can I come upstairs until that is done? Rosina changed me into my blue apprentice robes and asked me to sit down as she rang a bell. Fran came up the stairs holding some tea he had prepared and set a cup down in front of me. I took a sip, but despite Fran's tea always tasting good, I didn't taste much of anything this time. I set my cup down and looked at the both of them. Rosina spoke first. It happened yesterday. Fran and I went for our daily naps, and when we awoke, Dirk's cushion and the diapers had vanished from the room. We couldn't find Delia either, so already worried, I went to the orphanage to look for them. But Dirk was no worried, I went to the orphanage to look for them, but Dirk was nowhere to be seen. According to Wilma, Delia had come to get him, saying that she was taking him with her since their family. Wilma had apparently let her go, since she wanted to show her support for Delia having gone all the way to the orphanage despite her misgivings to see Dirk. She hadn't even considered that one of my attendants would take her anywhere, him anywhere except my chambers. I heard this from Rosina and requested an audience with the high priest. I thought it would be necessary to report the disappearance of a blue shrine maiden's attendant so that a search could begin. Bran said with a sigh, it would be serious business if she had gotten in trouble with the blue priest while I was absent. But on his way to see the high priest, Bran saw Delia with the high bishop, Dirk in her arms. She tr he tried to question her there, but the high bishop stopped him. He had no other choice but to ask the high priest what he knew. How is that allowed? Taking Delia makes sense because she, given that she used to be one of the high bishop's tenants, but Dirk isn't allowed to leave the orphanage, is he? I've been previously been told not to bring Dirk to a discussion with the high priest, and the high bishop seemed like he would be the kind of guy to demand that disgusting children be locked in the orphanage until their baptisms. So it didn't make sense that an orphan like Dirk would be allowed in the noble section of the temple. Fran lowered his eyes. Dirk is no longer an orphan. What? Dirk had been adopted by a noble with the High Bishop's author authorization. The High Bishop's signature was enough to validate an adoption, even without my signature as the orphanage director or the High Priest, if the adopting parent was a commoner, that is. Do noble adoptions not require the approval of the Archduke? Sir Daniel told us just this morning that the Archduke is absent. According to the High Priest, adoptions involving nobles from other duchies do not need the approval of our Archduke. In other words, no matter where you went, there were people who would specialize in exploiting loopholes in the law. Adoption to those outside of the duchy only needed the blood prince of the high bishop, the adoptive father, and the child. Dirk had already been adopted by an outsider noble. This isn't something to be happy about, is it? No, the high priest looked quite displeased. Fran crossed his arms and furrowed his brow, just like the high priest often did, then raised his head and looked me straight in the eyes. Sister mine, please give up on Delia and cut her off. Oh my god. I know well that you are a deeply compassionate person, but she acted on her own without the approval of her mistress, bringing you into great misfortune in the process. She cannot continue to serve as your attendant. You should relieve her of her duties if she elects to stay with the High Bishop. Delia would remain as my attendant until I announced that I was dismissing her. Rosina was fervently nodding, agreeing that she should have alerted me before going to the High Bishop for anything. It would be one thing if Delia's sudden betrayal made my head hurt. Why? That was the question that stirred my heart most. I looked out of my swaying tea before saying anything. I will dismiss Delia. Please call her so that I may inform her. Fran's stiff expression softened. It seemed that he thought I would be more hesitant to, dis to dismiss her. His arms still crossed in front of his chest, he said, understood, then left. I picked up my cup again now that the discussion had settled down. The tea that tasted like nothing before was now unbearably bitter. When Fran returned, Delia was with him. The rather pleased expression on her face was a sharp contrast to Fran's grimace. She casually walked over to me, her crimson hair fluttering behind her. Good morning, sister mine. What would you like to talk about? There wasn't a trace of malice in her expression. She looked so normal and spoke so much like she usually did that I felt a little dizzy. For a second, I even wondered if she hadn't actually taken Dirk to the High Bishop at all. A friend was in the stiff expressions brought me back to my senses and I shook my head. I heard that you returned to the High Bishop. I did, Delia said with an expression so full of glee that she was positively sparkling. When I told the High Bishop that the High Priest had looked for someone to adopt Dirk but couldn't find anyone... <sighs> God, why? Can y'all not be quiet? Can't get 
you done? some for us immediately, and a noble father at that. Isn't that incredible? Since adoptions by nobles here would require the Archduke's permission and thus he thus be delayed, he went out of his way to search among nobles from other duchies. He has many more connections than the high priest does. Does that not mean that you and Dirk will end up separated? I would have thought that Dirk being sent to the other duchy at once would be sent to the other duchy at once. Perhaps Delia will be sent with him as a caretaker? Either way, the high bishop had certainly gone out of his way to get an adoption that wouldn't need the Archduke's permission. These ominous signs were making me visibly worried, but Dili just laughed. Dirk will be raised by the High Bishop until he comes of age, as he is no longer an orphan. The High Bishop will give us one of his attendants, or attendants rooms and allow Dirk and I to live together. Wasn't that odd? If Dirk was going to be raised in the temple until he came of age, he wouldn't be able to go. The, he would be, wouldn't be able to go to the Royal Academy despite being adopted. Nor would he be able to grow up with his new family. For what purpose then would the noble have adopted Dirk? Even assuming he was just after his mana, it seemed like a strange decision to let the High Bishop raise him. I was getting increasingly worried the more I learned, but Delia gave a happy smile, her cheeks blurring, flushing a rosy red. Now I would have to be separated from Dirk. Had I remained with you, he would have been sent away to the orphanage in no time at all. Since Delia still couldn't bring herself to go to the orphanage, in her eyes, Dirk being sent there while she remained in the director's chambers was the same as them being stripped apart entirely. It was true that they wouldn't be living together even if she grew up more comfortably going to the orphanage. And once Dirk was baptized, he would be sent to the boys' building where it would be even harder for them to meet. What could I say to Delia considering that she had taken matters into her own hands to spend more time with Dirk? The two of you aren't being treated poorly, are you? No, of course not, Delia replied with a firm shake of her head. At the moment, the High Bishop was only showing Delia his good side. If she only knew him as a kindly grandpa, then she wouldn't believe anything bad I said about him. I took a deep in a deep breath. In that case, I hereby dismiss you as my attendant. You will now serve the High Bishop. Are you okay with that? Very. If that's all you have to say, Sister Mine, I would like to return to Dirk. His adoptive father will be arriving soon. And it felt like there was ash in my mouth when I forced myself to announce her dismissal. And yet Delia didn't seem to feel anything in particular at all. She was just excited to leave and get back to Dirk as soon as possible. My apologies for calling you over here, but I hope you know that Fran and Rosina were both worried sick looking for you and Dirk when you left unatt unannounced. Wilma was surprised. Gil was shocked to find the room empty when he came back from the workshop, and I myself was shaken when I heard the news this morning. We were all worried about what might have happened to you and Dirk. I would have liked for you to have at least said something before you left. In the end, I did let her know how I felt, hoping more for her to understand what she had done than to make her feel bad for it. Delia thought back, then smiled to hide whatever she was really feeling. The High Bishop said you wouldn't approve of me taking Dirk, so I decided to be more stealthy. I do apologize for that. I'm sorry, she said, averting her gaze as she shifted the blame to the High Bishop. So she had known that she was doing something I wouldn't approve of after all. Well, good luck raising Dirk. I imagine things won't be easy for you. Thank you and goodbye. Delia gave me a true smile this time, then left to return to Dirk. I was glad to see that she was happy, but I know that there was no way that would last. Once she was gone, I looked at Fran, Fran and Rosina. Will Delia and Dirk be okay? There is nothing more we can do now that Dirk is no longer an orphan. Delia chose this fate herself, Rosina said firmly. Why did they gotta be loud? If I can hear them, then the stupid mic is gonna pick it up. <sighs> I gave her a hesitant nod. You're right. But I still wanted to help her however I could, and as I thought about what I could do, Fran knelt down beside me. He took my hand and looked up at me with deadly serious eyes. Sister mine, even if Delia is to come calling, you must never visit the High Bishop under any circumstances, he said. I blinked in confusion, and with a face full of worry, he continued. When I went to get Delia, the High Bishop was extremely insistent that you go to his room to fetch her yourself. I repeated that it would not be proper for a mistress to leave her chambers for her attendant, and in the end, successfully left with Delia, but his change of behavior is frightening to me. The High Bishop had ordered that I never be brought to his room. He didn't even want to look at me, yet now he was telling Fran to bring me to him? He wanted me to dismiss Delia in his room. That change in behavior made Fran feel uncomfortable, and it certainly was strange. Furthermore, it seems that it was the High Bishop who had given the letter of invitation to the noble who caused a stir at the East Gate the other day. His name was on it, and the Knight's Order went to question him. He claimed that he just wanted to strengthen the bonds between our duchies, but the High Priest predicts that he wanted to noble inside the city so that he could acquire Dirk. Why would the High Bishop need a letter of invitation, or send a letter of invitation, if the Archduke hadn't approved it? It seems he didn't know, Fran said.
I tilted my head in confusion. He lowered his voice with an uncomfortable expression. The high bishop spent most of the winter in the temple and for the, dedica for the dedication ritual, and since he is not legally a noble, he is rarely invited to winter social gatherings. He simply was not aware that the rules had been changed. The high bishop technically wasn't a noble and was thus not invited to the gathering of noble society where the archduke had announced the change in rules. He had therefore tried inviting a noble from another duchy just like he had in the past. We do not know why the High Bishop has given Dirk to an outsider noble and drawn Delia to his side. I request that you take great care and approach the future with great caution. Fran's hands were shaking, perhaps out of worry for me. I squeezed them and gave him a nod. <sighs> the shadow falls. Sister Mine, would you, would you consider taking on a new attendant to replace Delia? Do I need a new one right now? Or do I need a new one right away? I wasn't living in the temple like I had been during the winter, so as far as I was aware, there wasn't enough work to require immediately replacing Delia. The sooner the better. Now that Dirk was gone, Fran could sleep at night and handle the more physical labor with Gil. Rosina, however, didn't want to hurt her fingers during chores, and Fran went on to explain that it would be better for everyone if Delia was replaced soon. If I may speak frankly for a moment, I know that you are still worried about Delia and having a ten have a tendency to be soft on those you care about. It would be easier for me to relax if there was someone other than Delia here for you to direct your compassion toward. I felt silent, unable to disagree that I was still soft at heart. He must have seen me looking around the room aimlessly for Delia at times, and in the end, Fran was right. It was more important for me to work toward ra easing Fran and Rosina's worries than for me to keep worrying about Delia, who was gone and would stay gone. I sighed and briefly lowered my eyes. If I am to pick one from the Great Shrine Maidens, perhaps Monica and Nicola will do? They had both helped... Ella cooked throughout the whole of winter. Wilma had re recommended their services, and I already knew they were diligent workers, not to mention that I could entrust both chores and helping the chefs to them. In reality, since the Italian restaurant was on the verge of completion, all the chef chefs except for Ella would soon be leaving. Ella wanted to stay to learn more recipes, and I had already negotiated with Bando to make that a reality. It had worked out the best anyway, since we needed someone to direct the new chefs. To direct the new chefs, Bando would be sending our way. Plus, it would be easiest for Ella to work with Monica and, and Nicola since they already knew each other. Monica and Nicola? Sister mine, would you be capable of taking both on at once? Fran, knowing the financial state of my chambers, whispered his concerns to me in a low voice. It was true that they might be a slight strain in my wallet depending on the season, but I already had more orders for the games we had made for our winter handiwork. And if the picture books continued to sell well, then I'll be perfectly fine. They both worked hard over the winter, did they, didn't they? If I only picked one of them to be my attendant, then it would be hard to ask the other to help again. Ultimately, I think it would be best to take them both on at once. I do not believe you need to concern yourself with the feelings of Grey Shrine Maiden Sister Mine. Rosina gave a bemused smile, but there was a big difference between living in the orphanage and living as an attendant. It would be hard to pick just one while knowing that. It would be easier to rest with them as your attendants instead of Delia, Fran interjected. Shall I go and summon them? Please do. They have no experience as attendants, so the faster we get them involved, the set more time we have to train them. Fran, will you be available to teach them? I wanted them to learn their duties before the Italian restaurant opened and took most of our kitchen staff, but Rosina was too concerned about hurting her fingers to be a proper example for cleaning. Either Fran or Gil would need to teach them, but that would be a lot harder to arrange if Fran didn't have the time. Now that I can entrust paperwork to Rosina, I will have enough time. Then contact Wilma and we can go to the orphanage tomorrow. We settled our plans for tomorrow, and at that moment there was a knock on the door. My attendants would come in at will without knocking, while temple residents like the high priest and his attendants used a bell. The only people who knocked were Lutz and Tuli, people from the lower city. Is that Lutz? He's a bit early today. Not much time had passed since fifth bell. I went to the stairs and peered down at the first floor while Fran walked down the steps to welcome the visitor. Daniel opened the door with a tense expression. Lutz was there as expected, but Tuli was actually there with him. Please come in. Fran gestured the two of them inside, and as the door was being shut behind them, I heard Gil yell, Hold on a sec! From somewhat far away, Fran waited with the door open for a bit until Gil eventually came running inside, gasping for breath. Tuli, what happened? We came to get you, mine. Let's go home together. Tuli smiled as she watched me race down the stairs. Things are dangerous right now, aren't they? I'll protect you, mine, she declared while thumping her chest. <laughs> what are you gonna do, Tuli? I'm sorry. I know it's not. It's a nice sentiment, but good God, Tuli, what do you think is gonna happen if something were to happen? If something were to happen? Daniel would be able to protect her more, heck more, way more than Tuli could. Actually, out of all of them, if mine was there and had to protect herself, Tuli would be more of a, more of a help than mine is, to be honest. Because mine is weak. Physically weak. 
Mana wise, oh good god, she thump anybody. <laughs> but are we seriously getting into the climax already? Really? Hold on a second here. We're not even halfway done. Do we seriously have a whole heck of a lot of side stories coming in on this? Wow. Okay. I'm not complaining. I'm surprised though. Uh, do, 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 uh, Tuli Smile, uh, da, 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 da. Gil planted his feet firmly on the ground and puffed out his own chest as if competing with her. I'll protect you, Sister Mine. I'm your attendant. I appreciate the enthusiasm, you two, but I think it will just make things harder for my bodyguard. I looked up at Daniel, who would need to guard all of us kids, and he gave an exasperated shrug. Yeah, the more people there are for me to protect, the more dangerous it gets. Right. Please forgive them just this once, Sir Daniel. Tuli didn't know. I go back now that they had all arrived. It was a lot, a bit sooner than expected, but I decided to go home with everyone. Rosina helped me change and quickly prepared for my departure. Fran, please send more to the orphanage. <sighs> Shut up! I'll be hurrying home soon. Or home now. Understood. I wait your safe return. We left the temple walking down the street with Lutz and Gil in front, me and Tuli behind them, and Daniel behind us. I appreciate the thought, Tuli, but really, you really shouldn't walk me home like this, I warned. Why not? If something dangerous happens, Sir Daniel will have to focus on protecting me. He may not be able to protect us both at once and fear her with us. Daniel may have been a knight, but he couldn't do everything. And naturally, he was here to guard me, not her. My safety would be his priority in emergency. And there was no guarantee he would be able to save Tuli if anything happened. He might have to abandon her while fleeing with me. In worst case scenario, she might be taken as a hostage to be used against us. If anything, you're in more danger here than I am. Okay... Tuli puffed out her cheeks and frowned at me, pouting. I knew that she wanted to say she could protect me too, but not even her cute face would change the facts. Me being in danger was one thing, but I couldn't let Tuli put herself at risk like this. We passed through the central plaza and headed south to, Craft south to Craftsman's Alley, then took a turn that would lead us home. We headed down a side path with fewer people than the main road, and there we saw Otto of all people. He was holding a spear and looking around as he walked, entirely as if patrolling the city. Oh, it is the climax! Good God, there must be a lot of stories. Hi, Otto. It's been a while. Mine? Otto's face lit up the second he saw me. I'm glad you're safe. Seriously, now I don't have to worry about the captain beating me to death. The fact that this was his reaction to seeing me was more than a little unsettling. Had he done something that would encourage Dad to beat him to death? Otto, what did you do? Me? It was the commander of the East Gate and the guards on duty. Otto replied with a shrug. Apparently, he had been inside doing paperwork when the guards standing at the gate and the commander made some mistake that could be worthy of Dad beating them to death. He had just been sent out here to try and clean up their mess. It happened this afternoon when the captain contacted the commanders of every other gate and went to the center of town to tell them something important. What? I widened my eyes. That important something was probably the fact that the Archduke was absent and there would be no new permits given. I had a really bad feeling about what was coming next. According to Otto, despite Dad being at afternoon shift, he had gone to work at the East Gate long before it was time to switch shifts. He immediately went to the commander, explained the circumstances, and had him organize a meeting with the other commanders in the center of the city. Then he told them what Daniel had told him, that the Archduke is absent and that there will be forced permits before returning to the East Gate. By the time the captain came back, they had already let a noble's carriage train through. The commander of the East Gate hadn't told the guards anything, so they never even considered that the permit might be fake. The captain only learned of their mistake when it was time for his shift. He blasted the heck out of the commander for not telling all of the guards what he'd said. Then ran off to the temple to make sure you were okay. You didn't see him there? I instinctively looked up at Daniel, more concerned about the fact that a noble's carriage train had been let inside than the fact that I had missed Dad on the way here. His eyes were open wide in disbelief. They let carriages through. Don't tell me, was it the same noble from the other day? Yep, you sure know a lot. It was the one and the same. Right now, all the guards at the East Gate are looking for them, but nobody's found them. Maybe they're already in the Nobles' Quarter? I would have thought the Knights at the North Gate would have caught them there, if there would have caught them there, though. Otto wondered out loud. It seemed that despite the Archduke having forbidden the entry of nobles from outside the city into the duchy, not all soldier soldiers shared the same sense of danger and urgency. You contacted the Knights' Order, didn't you? Daniel shouted, his eyebrows shooting up in anger, but Otto put a hand on his chin and had to think before answering. Who knows? Maybe the commander did? The captain took off, ran off straight away, so maybe they didn't know yet? You should have reported this immediately, fool. Daniel took out his shining wand as he yelled at Otto for his lack of urgency. He ignored Otto, who was murmuring, huh? Wait, you're a noble? After seeing the wand appear out of thin air and shot the red light, signaling a call for aid into the air.
The night should be coming now, I thought to myself in relief while looking up at the red light shooting upward, only to see Dooley totally disappear out of the corner of my eye. Yep, we're at the climax, everybody! The next two, three episodes, I think, of the, of the anime are coming. What? Two? Before I could even turn around, something prickly covered my face and made my vision go dark. I felt myself be lifted into the air, then started bouncing up and down. Eek! I could tell from the arms wrapped around my legs and back that someone had picked me up and started running. In a panic, I tried floating about, but the best I could do while restrained was just weakly hit my hands against whatever rough thing was covering me. Judging by the streaks of light poking through the holes in the cloth in front of my face, I could guess that they had pulled a bag over me, then picked me up. Help! Mine! Thule! Give them back! I heard lots of damn yell yell behind the veil of darkness, with several pairs of footsteps racing after me. Thule had been kidnapped as well. I could hear what sounded like her screaming. Given that the bustle of the main street was growing fainter, the kidnapper was probably running in the opposite way down the alley. Captain, mine's in that bag. Let go of my daughter. I heard Otto yell, then my dad roared with anger, then suddenly my body was spinning through the air. I assumed the kidnapper had thrown me aside to defend against Dad's attack. In the darkness, I couldn't tell what was happening, and I could do nothing as I hit the stone ground and rolled across it. Ow! Mine! Sister mine! Just as I heard Lutz and Gilda at panic cries, the bag was tugged, forcing me to sit up. I blinked in the darkness, and seconds later the bag was ripped off, giving me my vision back. The sudden brightness made me, spit, made me squint. I kept sitting on the ground, looking around as I tried to adjust to the light again. Lutz and Dam Gil peered at me while Daniel scanned the area, standing protectively by my side. Behind him to the right was Dad, his spear drawn and auto. Where's Thule? Over there, Gil replied, his eyes full of anger and frustration. I followed where he was looking and saw Thule being held hostage. A man had a knife at her throat and was backing away to escape. Thule, her eyes locked on the knife, was frozen in terror. No, she choked out, the blood draining from her face as she trembled, tears rolling up in her eyes. All of the mana inside me immediately boiled over, coursing through my body. In a single instant, something inside of me snapped like a twig. Mine! Sister mine! I slowly stood up. My body was hot enough to boil water. My mind was as cool and composed as an icy river. I had spent about a year in the temple, offering my mana on a regular basis, including during a large-scale ritual, and apparently I had gotten so much, be much better at controlling my mana than I thought. The crushing that had hit all those in eyesight back when I was furious at the High Bishop can now be directed as a single target. My instincts made me certain of that. Hey, what do you think you're doing to my Thule? I asked, glaring at the main man pressing his knife against Thule's neck. His face immediately changed. Before I had been red with anger and adrenaline, but now it was a darkish purple as though he had been stopped from breathing. He tried to twist out of the way of my crushing, but he could barely move at all. His face stiffened, eyes wide open. Get your dirty hands off of Thule and get out of my sight or she won't be the one dying here. You will. The world around me slowed, and as the man began to convulse and foam over the mouth, I gradually strengthened the force of my ma the mana hitting him more and more. His mouth moved, and a second later, something sharp whistled through the air and stabbed through the man's arm. What? I blinked in surprise, coming back to my senses just as t Dad left at the man, dagger in hand. Unable to dodge due to the crushing's lingering influence, the kid never took the blade head on. He screamed as blood spurted from the wound. Dad then pushed him down and Tuli went tumbling down to the ground as they fought. Tuli, are you okay? Gil and Lutz immediately ran over to Tuli, wiping the man's splattered blood off her cheeks. I was so scared, Tuli said, sitting on the ground in shock. I started to run over too, but just as I took my first step, I saw something flash in the corner of my eye. I spun around and saw that the other man, the one my dad had been fighting with, and probably the one who had tried kidnapping me, was raising his hand. There was a ring on his finger, and its face stone was glowing. I instantly understood that he was pouring mana into it, and did this the first thing I could think of. I turned to Dad, who was finishing off the other man, and yelled, Dad, look out! I spun around to, and Daniel roared, Gundra, get back, as he leapt toward him to push him away. Once he had pushed Dad away, a shield-like thing appeared over Daniel's left hand, which he used to block the beam of mana that had shot toward him. The man must not have considered that his attack might be blocked, as he looked at Daniel and stepped back, shaken. Gundra, this man has mana. I'll take care of him. You all get back to the temple and alert Lord Ferdinand. Understood. Otto, get mine. Dad yelled before picking up Tuli, whose legs were too shaky for her to stand, and sprinting toward the main street. Having snapped back to their senses, Les and Gale ran after him. Otto picked me up and followed, too, heading back to the temple. Mine, you're bleeding. Otto grimaced in sympathetic pain as he ran. I followed his eyes to my knees, where blood was flowing all the way down to my shins. That must have happened when I was dropped. It hadn't hurt at all thanks to the adrenaline, but the second I saw the wound, a sharp pain, pa sharp, sudden sharp pang of pain hit me. My own blood reminded me of the blood that had sprayed from the other man. Otto, this is a bad situation where we really need to we need help really bad, right? I asked, watching Dad, Lutz, and Gail weaving through the front of people on the main street. 
Otto basically shrieked in response, What else does it look like? I just wanted to make sure nobody would get mad if I called for help. I pressed my thumb against the bloody wound on my knee, then pulled out the necklace I had made sure to wear at all times so I could stamp my blood against this back. It's black onyx-like stone. For an instant, it shone with a yellow light, but nothing else happened. The only change was the yellow flame that now wavered inside the black stone. And it probably sent more to Sylvester, or was just a magic tool to lo broadcast my location. I had no way of knowing despite how having stamped my blood on it. What's that thing? A charm. Apparently, it'll help me when I'm in danger. I slid the magic necklace back under my clothes. Still... <sighs> okay. Apparently, it'll help me when I'm in danger. I slid the magic necklace back under my clothes, still not knowing what I had done. And that was when we passed by the Gilberto Company. Tully and Lutz, you go inside with Otto and stay at his place. Dad instructed while setting Tully down in front of the door. Dad looked, Lutz looked up at him, gasping for air. Mr. Gunther, I can... Yo, get in the way. Dad shut Lutz down before he could ask to come with us. But Gil is going. Gil lives in the temple. You're different. We don't need people who can't fight, Dad said. Slicing Lutz's hopes to shreds before turning to Otto and giving him a hard look as I was set down. Otto, I'm entrusting Tuli to you. I'm taking mine to the temple. Captain, mine. Be careful out there, okay? Otto clenched a fist and bent his elbow. Dad did the same, tapping his fist against Otto's. It'll be fine. The night's order is out. His expression still hard. Dad pointed his fist upward. We could see several face stone high beasts racing through the sky, probably heading to where Daniel was. If so, they would reach him in no time. Let's go, mine. Dad picked me up and started sprinting to the temple. Oh boy, here we go. How much? I'm not even. <laughs> I'm not even at 200 pages yet. Good God. And that would still leave 129 pages. That's not even counting the afterward, actually. A noble from another duchy. Dad reached the temple with me in his arms, and for some reason, Fran was already there, waiting. Was already waiting at the gate. Why was he there when Bree hadn't had the time to tell him when we were coming back? Fran, what brings you to the gate? Did something happen? I saw the call for the Knight's Order pierce the sky and considered it possible that you would be returning soon. I think I will be right. Fran said, looking us over. He could guess that something serious had happened by the fact that Lutz and Tully weren't with, it, weren't with me and Dad was here in Daniel's place. Fran, we need to talk to the High Priest. He is not here. What? We could talk in your chambers. Gail, my apologies, but please wait here for Sir Daniel. I ask that you instruct him to go not to the High Priest's room, but to Sir my Sister Mai's chambers. Upon arriving in my chambers, Fran poured a glass of water for Dad, who had just sprinted across the whole city, carrying me. We then moved to the hall to talk. Fran was the first to do so, speaking in a quiet voice. I will begin from when you and the others left, Sister Mine. It hadn't been long after I had started being escorted home that Dad arrived in my chambers. He said that the noble from before had just entered the city, asking Fran to report that to the high priest before sprinting back to the city to check that I was okay. I hurried to the high priest's room to tell him what had happened, but unfortunately, Arnold informed me that he was absent. With no other options available, I decided to return to your chambers, but I was stopped by Delia on the way. Delia? Did she have something bit some business with you? She said that Dirk's adoptive father had arrived and wished to discuss Dirk's health with you since you had raised him. But I sent her away as you had already left. I was relieved that you were not here while the high priest was absent, but... Fran frowned at me as if expressing his frustration that I had returned, but I wouldn't have any of that. A lot happened to me, too. I told Fran exactly what had happened on my way home. He crossed his arms and fell into thought. If we consider both sides of this, this story, it is possible that the High Priest was summoned by the Knight's Order. He will likely return when Sir Daniel does. The Archduke is always accompanied by a group of Knights when visiting the Sovereignty, so there is no mistaking that the Knight's Order is lacking in manpower right now. He murmured, Sister Mine, please change it to your blue robes before Sir Daniel arrives. I put my robes on my robes with the help of a worried-looking Rosina, and it wasn't too long after that Gail returned with Daniel. The Knight's Order had contained the disturbance in the Lower City and instructed him to return to his guard duty. Fran gave them both water and explained the circumstances in the temple. That's strange, Damien muttered in confusion. I didn't see Lord Ferdinand among the other knights. They even told me to report this to him. Are you sure he's not here? We were all confused by this revelation and so decided to try visiting the High Priest room once more. At the very least, we would have to interrogate Arnold as to where he had gone. Damien made it clear that the situation was bad enough to demand the level of dra that level of drastic action. Apprentice, hold on to this. Daniel, as if suddenly remembering he had it, took a ring out of a small pouch on his hip and placed it on my hand. It had a small, slightly murky gem attached to it. This is evidence I got off the man but from before. See the noble's family crest on it? I shouldn't have something this important. 
It's small and not that high quality, but it's got a face stone. Hold on to it in case something happens. Unlike Lord Ferdinand, I don't have any decent face stones I can lend to you. Apparently, as a noble on the poor end of the spectrum, Daniel didn't have enough face stones to be able to lend one to someone else. I put the ring on figuring that it would be better than nothing, even if it did belong to a criminal. It didn't change size to fit my finger, perhaps because it wasn't a magic tool like the ring the high priest would always give me. It might be broken. The crest is all we need for evidence, and there's no point in, point in putting it on if you can't use it. Can you put mana into it? Daniel asked. I tried pouring mana into the ring. Um, it looks like I can, just a bit. Unlike the ring, the high priest always let me. I could barely put out any of my put any of my mana into the ring. That's a low quality stone. It might shatter if you put too much mana into it at once. Be careful. I clenched my fist so as not to let the black half broken ring slip off my finger. As Fran prepared to take us to the high priest room, I was positioned directly behind him with Dad and Daniel on either side of me. Gil, watch over my chambers for me. As a child with no fighting experience, he would be staying behind. He had been taught his whole life that violence was wrong, and this shock of seeing someone killed in a spray of blood today had really gotten to him. He looked sick, and it was obvious that he wasn't in a good state of mind, but as much as I wanted to stay with him, that simply wasn't an option right now. So we left the room, a stiff-faced Gil seeing us off. Sister mine, please be careful. Please. We entered the noble area of the temple just as the high bishop and a group of people turned into the same hallway. Uh-oh. Besides, the plump-bellied high bishop was an ugly toad-like man who was just as overweight. He wore different clothes, but he was a spinning image of an evil minister or some other politician. They were followed by great shrine maidens and some plainly dressed servants, bringing their party up to about ten people. Fran smoothly turned a nearby corner to avoid the high bishop's group, taking us into a hallway that led to the noble's gate. It would be a long detour to the high priest room, but that was better than meeting the high bishop along the way. Oh, yeah. Dad stand a chance... Dad picked me up. Daniel scanned the area and Fred led the way as we power walked to the high priest room. Sir Daniel, who was that with the high bishop? Count Bindelwald. He's the arch noble from another duchy who used a forge permit to enter the city. We can guess he's here for you, whispered Daniel in a quiet voice, causing Dad to trip, tighten his arms around me. We might be able to catch him if the Ice Order or even Lord Ferdinand were here. But I don't stand a chance alone. He's of a much higher status than me and has much more mana. He may not know how to fight like we knights do. But that doesn't matter when he can just overwhelm us, Mio, with mana. Oh, yeah. The door closest to the noble's gate gave it to view. We turned the corner to head to the high priest's room, only to see the high bishop's party blocking the hallway. Oh, great! I think they might have spotted you and decided and realized where you were going, so they headed you off. We had intended to avoid them, but they had seen us and backtracked to get here first. That's exactly what happened. Count Bindewald, that is the blue apprentice shrine made in mine. The High Bishop said with a nasty grin and a finger pointed at me. Bindelwald's lips twisted into a frog-like smile as he looked me over from head to toe. Oh, I see. His disgusting gaze sent goosebumps all over my skin and I subconsciously squeezed Dad tighter. I honestly deserve praise for holding back my rage to urge to shout, Don't look at me! Hmm, we were told she had left, but here she returns to her guardians. I suppose they failed them, useless fools. Or failed them, useless fools. Bindelwald muttered in a frustrated tone before extending a hand my way. Mine, I shall grace you with the contract. I respectfully refuse. I am already promised to someone. Hm. You may be in his custody, but I imagine you've signed no contract. All I need to do is get your blood on one first. I told that out a disturbing cackle, and his stomach bounced as he took a step forward. Are you going to adapt sister mine too, Count Bindelwald? Delia, you are a, you are a very naive little girl. Delia, stepping out from behind the high bishop with Dirk in her arms, spoke in a bright tone. It will be fitting the situation. How wonderful. She and Dirk will be one big happy family. They'll both be graced with the blessings of the nobility. The toad snorted derisively at Delia's words. Me? Adopt a filthy commoner? Never. But sir, you've already adopted Dirk. I did not adopt him. What I have with that baby is a submission contract. The count cackled and took out what looked like a proper adoption contract, but across its title, one could see there were two layers of parchment. parchment. A broad smile spread across his face. He peeled up the front layer to reveal the text beneath. Submission contract for a devouring child. What? Does that mean Dirk will... He will be kept as a slave for the rest of his life and used as a living source of mana to charge magic tools for Bindelwald, I said. Dewey squeezed Dirk tighter and shook her head in fear before desperately looking at the High Bishop. That can't be true! She's lying, isn't she, High Bishop? You said Dirk and I will be staying together, didn't you? Fear not, Delia. The baby's mana will be used for our sake, but he will be raised here in the temple. He will not be taken from you. The high bishop said in a gentle tone, his face that of a kindly grandfather. This is merely a trade. I will keep that baby in return. Mine will leave the temple. Delia paled, looking between Dirk and I. Sister mine will leave the temple in Dirk's stead? She murmured in disbelief. 
Then a fat belly blocked her from you. This is your submission contract. Sign it. You have made me lose many of my pawns both today and in the spring. You will be filling the hole left by them yourself. No! The count took a step forward and we all took a step back. A door to the high priest's room and perhaps our only hope of being rescued was behind them. High priest, I whispered. The high bishop smirked. Unfortunately, your guardian, the high priest, is absent. No cavalry will be coming to your, to your aid. Give up already so that I never have to see your, my eyes on you again. Well, if you had just not bothered ta being around her, then you wouldn't have to worry about this, though, would you? He turned to look at the ta toad standing a few steps in front of him. Count Bendewald, with both the archduke and the high bishop gone, high priest gone, this is our best opportunity. You may take mine, and I will pretend I saw nothing. Capture her and leave the city as soon as you can. At these words, the tension in the air grew thick. Dad carefully set me down, took one step forward, and readied his spear. Daniel reared his weapon as well, clenching his teeth in preparation of facing a noble more powerful and of a higher status than him. Even Fran took out a dagger from the pouch on his hip. Wow, you have a way of defending yourself. That's good. You can kill everyone but the girl. Get her. On the frog's command, three men from their group stepped forward. They all carried themselves like the man Dad had killed, and they were like living examples of what happened to people with the devouring who signed with nobles. Apprentice, get back. Damia blocked two of the men who jumped at us, while Dad and Fran handled the other one. The Count's personal soldiers weren't as capable as Damiel, a formerly trained knight. It took them longer to build up mana for simple attacks, and they weren't able to fight as well as him. But taking on two people at once was still difficult, and while Damiel was just barely managing, one more move could cost him his life. Dan and Fran seemed like they should have been able to dominate the other guy, but since they had no defense against mana, it wasn't as simple as that. Dad would have won in no time had it just been a sword fight, but there was nothing a commoner could do when attack with mana. The man's ring lit up, and just as the beam was shot toward Dad and Fran, Daniel whipped out his wand and swung. A sharp noise like the clash of metal rang out as Mana defected Mana. As a noble, the moment Daniel made his wand, wand appear, both the toad and the high bishop hardened their expressions. The high bishop bore down on Delia, spitting, spittle flying out of his mouth as he yelled, Delia, who is that? The knight assigned to guard Sister Mind, Delia squeaked out in a quiet voice, too scared to think straight. The High Bishop's eyes widened and he pointed at Daniel. That shabby looking man is a knight? Do. The High Priest must have been hiding information from him. Although the High Bishop knew I had been assigned a guard, he didn't know that Daniel was a noble, nor that he was a knight, and the fact that he was still wearing his plain clothes for visiting the lower city had made them that even harder to guess. We won't have much time if the Knight's Order is alerted. I will have to make him disappear as well. Well, the Knight's Order has already been alerted, dude. The Count had previously just been watching with a grin, but now poured Mana into his ring with a grim expression before whipping his hand through the air. A light blue ball of Mana shot out of his ring, heading straight for Daniel. Look out! I swung my hand as well, copying his motions. A whitish ball of Mana shot out, hitting the Count's glowing blue Mana and knocking it away. His Mana struck the wall with a loud bang, but the wall itself was completely unscathed, as though it had just absorbed the Mana. Which wouldn't surprise me. How dare a devouring commoner oppose me! The Count said frustratedly, pouring even, putting even more mana into his ring. I washed his hands carefully and did the same, taking care not to pour as much mana into my ring that it would break. The most I could do with the ring this week was send a small burst of mana that would knock his mana, of course. And yet I had to do something. Daniel was busy with two men already and didn't have the leeway to do anything about the Count. This is a lot better than physical combat, at least. If Bindelwald leapt at me or came swinging, I would lose in an instant. But in a mana duel, I could at least buy some time. Well, I mean, girl, you could overwhelm him with how much mana you have. Just how long will you last using a pathetic amount of mana like that? Oh, she can last a while! With how much mana she has? She could last a while with just doing a small burst. The Count landed at, the, at another toad-like cackle, launching ball after ball of mana at me like a lion teasing a small animal. Eek! I knocked him away using as little mana as possible so as to not break the crappy ring on my finger. Daniel, Dad, and Fran were all busy fighting the people in front of them. The power balance will crumble in an instant if Bindelwald started launching mana at them. Losing wasn't an option, and realizing that made my breathing harder and cold. Anxious and cold, anxious sweat started running in my back. Huh. <laughs> After knocking away as many balls of mana that I had lost count, Bindelwald stopped launching them and glared at me with disgust. I had probably lasted longer than he expected. I can keep going. Clenching my fist so that the loose ring wouldn't fall off, I eyed Bindelwald head on. It was then that his eyes fell on my ring. Hmm? What's that, I spy? To think you were already wearing a submission ring. Aha, uh -huh, what a joke. There was never any need to bother with this. I've already won. No, you have not. She has to sign that contract for that ring to be pa to be uh, activated to be powerless against you. She has to sign that contract. Bindelwald burst into laughter. I was apparently wearing a ring given to those with the Devouring who had signed a submission contract, which once sworn made them unable to attack their master. I mean, she's been attacking you, dude. 
Furthermore, it couldn't be removed until their master, in this case Count Bindewald, voided their contract. The rings were vile. The master could pour his own mana into them to inflict pain on any slave who dared disobey him. Bindewald gave a smug cackle and looked down at me. Obey me if you don't want to suffer. I took the ring off right before his eyes. It probably wasn't functioning as intended since we hadn't signed a contract and it was already half broke. Just saying, it comes right off. What? The toad widened his eyes. Behind him, the high bishop's balding head was bright red with anger. Insolent girl, he shouted before ripping Dirk out of Delia's hands. Ah, it happened so suddenly that Delia could do nothing but stare, her eyes wide as the high bishop forcefully drained mana out of Dirk using a face stone. The baby's face paled and he started convulsing in the high bishop's tight grip. Dirk! Delia screamed, reaching out to take him back, but the high bishop just clicked his tongue and knocked Delia's hands away. Babies never have enough mana. Dude, he has enough to have a, be, a, be a, a strong men noble. Give him a break, he's a baby. He snorted after finishing stealing mana from Dirk. He then swung his hand and shot out a ball of mana. I hurriedly put the ring back on and deflected the shot, then glared at the high bishop with clenched teeth. How dare you do that to Dirk? Anger filled my entire body, but before I could crush him, the high pre bishop swept, thrust the now limp and exhausted Dirk out in front of him. You jerk. I can't wait to see this guy die. Sadly, we don't get to see it, but whatever. Huh, are you capable of attacking this baby? Do you have it in you to ruin Delia's life? Stop, sister mine, please stop, I'm begging you. Delia screamed in terror, her face contorting miserably as she saw Dirk using being used as a human shield. I couldn't crush anyone with her begging desperately like that. I sucked it in an anxious gulp of air, not knowing what to do, and then it happened. One of the High Bishop's shrine maidens grabbed me from the side, having stealthily walked over while everyone was distracted. Eek! Mine! Yes, good job, Jenny. Keep it holding her down. The High Bishop exclaimed before throwing the limp Dirk at Delia. I could see Delia crying and hugging Dirk out of the corner of my eye. Let go of me, I screamed at the shrine maiden. No. While I was taken in by the High Bishop and forced to offer flowers day by day, ugh, I feel bad for her. Rosina and Wilma were taken in by you and allowed to experience the comfort we once had under Sister Christine. That is not something, simply something I can figure out. Hello? She didn't know that. She didn't know that you had also gone through that. And even if she had, there I doubt there was anything she could do about it considering the High Bishop had taken her. She couldn't really go against him, but still. Jenny's sing-song voice whispers were tinged with sweetness, but the seething hatred hidden beneath it all sent an icy chill down my back. If I was taken away by the temple, Rosina and Wilma would be sent back to the orphanage. Jenny wanting nothing, wanted nothing more than for them to be miserable there, and I knew there was nothing I could say that would make her let go of me. We can consider the contract done, then, Bindewald said with a throaty laugh. He started walking this way. Jenny's grip didn't loosen, no matter how much I struggled. She was left with slender, with slender arms, but a weak child like myself couldn't even come close to her power, overpowering an adult woman's grip. Bindewald took out his shining wand and turned it into a knife. The look in his eyes as he brandished it was the spitting image of how Shikikosa had looked at me. They were the eyes of a noble who believed that, as a commoner, I was inferior to him, and that me submitting to him was the proper way of the world. All I could do was tremble in fear just like I had when Shikikosa had pulled a knife on me. The tip of the glowing blade grew, cl gl grew closer than cut my fingertip. Ow! Unlike the shallow cuts Lutz would make for blood, for blood stamps, Bindewald had dug deep into my finger, paying no mind to any pain or lasting damage. Blood almost immediately began to sweep, seep from the wound. Open your hand. He took out a contract and pushed it toward me, wearing a nasty grin all the while. His toad-like face only got more disgusting as he came, cl came up close to me. I glared at him, squeezing my hand shut as hard as I could in defiance. But there was no stopping the blood from dripping out. I told you to open your hand. I flailed about trying to avoid him grabbing my hand and wrenching it open. I was weak enough that it would be over as soon as his hands were on mine. No, 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 go away. Ow! Let go of her. I heard a roar and a second later, Dad j kicked Jenny from behind as hard as he could. The sheer force sent us both flying toward Bindawa. I slammed it to his fat belly, knocking us all onto the ground, and for a second I couldn't breathe, squashed between Jenny and him as I was. Within seconds, Dad raced over and pulled me out from between them before picking me up and holding me in one arm. Sorry about that, mine. Did I make it in time, he asked, not looking at me. He pulled Jenny up a bit with his free head as she gasped for air, then kicked up into her stomach. She flew off Bindawa with a gurgle, vomit spewing from her mouth. That was just cruel, muttered the high bishop. Both he and his attendants were trembling at the sight of violence that was never normally seen in the temple. Says the guy who's trying to force a tiny girl into a submission contract against her will. Dad gave them a cold look. So you're saying it's not cruel to steal, stab a little girl with a knife and force her into a slave contract she doesn't agree to? I have to agree. Silence, commoner. Bindewald, whose face was bright red in humiliation as he sat up on the ground, on the floor, angrily swung his ringed hand. He shot at a larger blast of mana than ever before, and the massive ball of shiny blue mana came right for us. It was too close for me to launch my own blast of mana to deflect it. I'm dead. I squeezed my eyes shut as the ball shot toward me, but Dad was braver. 
He grabbed me in a hug and immediately leapt to the side, rolling as he hit the floor. Dead! He hadn't completely dodged the mana attack. His left shoulder draw to his, down to his elbow was bright red, as though he had been burnt. The sight of him groaning in pain flipped a switch inside of me. Oh, now you've pissed her off even more. I rolled out of Dad's arms and stood up. I locked my eyes on Bindelwald, who was building up mana for a second attack, and hit him with all my mana from this very start. I will make you pay, I shouted, and the force of all the mana in my body made the face stone on the ring burst its part like a pop balloon. In the same moment, the full force of my crushing hit Bindelwald. He blinked and then fell to his knees, eyes wide open in surprise. He tried to move his trembling hands, only to find he couldn't move them at all, as if heavy weights were crushing his body from all sides. I had no intention of letting him do anything else. Count Bindelwald, the High Bishop's panic voice since my head turning toward him in a glare. I wasn't scared of him now that he had given up his human shield. But the second after that thought passed through my mind, he took out a black face stone from the packet of his robes. Don't think the same trick will work on me twice. The black face stone in his hands was sucking my mana right out of the air. He gave a smug smirk. I kept crushing him with mana, but it was all sucked straight into the stone. Uh, I let my guard down to think that she had that much mana in her. Oh, she probably has more, Bindelwald said. I saw him staggering to his feet out of the corner of my eye before making his wand appear, his scornful smile replaced by a completely blank expression. Now we're halfway, th we're halfway through this. Good God. Not even halfway, actually. The Black Charm. Apprentice, Damiel, a panicked expression on his face, took out a shining wand and stood between the Count and me. As he protected my right side with a red light, I could continue pouring mana into the High Bishop's stone as his face twisted with smug assurance in his own victory. You waste your time, he said, barking a laugh, but a second later, the black face stone made a popping sound and a sliver of yellow light started to shine through it. A crack ran across the face stone's smooth surface, then another. Ha ha, it's about to break. What? The High Bishop murmured in shock. I ignored him, glaring intently at the face stone as I continued to pour mana into it. The black face stone was turning yellow before my eyes. What's going on? The black faded, and for a brief moment, combined with the yellow inside the face stone to make it look gold. A dazzling bright light shone through the bitty cra thin cracks, and then the face stone began to crumble like sand. The High Bishop watched the golden dust slip through his fingers, his lips trembling, and his eyes wider than ever before as he struggled to believe what he had just witnessed. Meanwhile, I continued crushing him with my mana. Fine, what in the world are you- mm. The High Bishop glared at me with bloodshot eyes and immediately clutched his chest and started coughing blood as my crushing hit him head on. I started to pile on more mana, but then heard Daniel grunt in pain. I spun toward him and saw that he was kneeling on the ground, having been hit hard by one of Bindelwald's balls of mana. He might have lo must have lost even the strength to grip his shining wand as it fell from his hand and disappeared into thin air. Daniel slowly bent forward as if following it down, the collapsed on the ground. Sir Daniel! I raced over to him. His breathing was ragged and he had fallen unconscious. Not even calling out his name woke him up. All he did was groan. <laughs> what kind of pathetic knight can't even withstand a mana strike of that size? The toad sneered, letting out a snort. Daniel was defenseless while he was unconscious. I looked around for help and saw that th of the three devouring soldiers on the high bishop's side, only one was still standing, and even he was just barely staying upright. But this third man was quickly taken care of as Dad grabbed his head and slammed it into the ground like he was dunking a basketball, and his eyes rolled back in his head as he fell unconscious. Dad, Dad then sped my way, guarding his limp left arm. Mine! Dad! Fred had been injured during the fight and was gasping for air while slumped against the door leading to the noble's gate. The high bishop was kneeling on the ground and coughing up more blood as his attendant, gray shrine maiden, skittered around nervously. Adelia was hugging the limp dirk, frozen in place. The only one still standing largely unhurt were the count and me. All of a sudden, in the midst of all the chaos, the door to the high priest room opened. Out stepped the high priest, despite the fact that he was said to have been absent. Ha ha! His eyes widened at the disaster area in the hallway. What in the world happened here? Anyone would have been surprised to leave their room to find a bunch of injured people sprawled out on the ground, some of them looking like corpses. But the biggest question I had was why he hadn't noticed us sooner given all the noise we had been making right outside his door. Good question on that. That was the most confusing thing about the whole situation. High Priest, I am certain that Arnold said you were absent. Why are you here? The High Bishop demanded his voice sound almost a shriek. The High Priest looked at him completely unfazed. I believe that should be self-evident. I told Arnold to inform any visitors that I was absent. Since I was, in fact, not in my room proper, that was not a lie. That, no doubt, meant he had been hunkered down in his lecture room. It was completely sealed off from the outside world. Outside room using mana, which explained why he hadn't heard us. That explains it. I guess it's soundproofed. The high priest scanned the hallway, taking in all that he saw. He narrowed his eyes a bit when I met his gaze, so I hid behind Dad. It was pro probably obvious that I had let my mana run loose. As I swallowed hard, trembling in fear of being tied to a chair, and lectured about the horrors of boiling skin, <laughs> the high priest rubbed his temple and turned to the high bishop. 
That is enough about me, High Bishop. I would like to explain what has happened here. We seem to have a visitor who I've never seen before, and I have to ask who he is exactly. The High Bishop made no attempt to answer the High Priest's question, and instead just pressed his lips together and glared back at him. The Shining One had already disappeared from Vendelwald's hand, and he looked at the High Priest with the arrogant expression of a noble. Is there any need for me to give my name to a priest? I am here on proper, author proper authorization. I would like to see your permit. And why would I bother wasting my time dealing with the likes of a mere high priest? I had thought that the high priest was a fairly high-status noble from his dealings with the Knight Order, but Bindelwald was from another duchy and saw him as just another temple priest, high priest or not. His arrogance was coming out in full force, and seemingly influenced by that, the high bishop regained his own smug confidence. He stood up and wiped the blood from his mouth, his face contorting each time he coughed. High Priest, this is a noble from Ar Ehrensbach. Don't tell me that you intend to cause a diplomatic incident while the Archduke is gone. I believe you are the one who has caused a diplomatic incident. The Archduke is absent for the Archduke Conference, which means he is not available to sign any permits for outsider nobles, the High Priest, priest coldly replied. The High Bishop faltered and looked around. When his eyes fell on me, his lips curved into a nasty grin. He was given the permit far ahead of time. Therefore, this incident is not my responsibility. Mine is the one who disturbed the peace of the temple and attacked a noble. If anyone is responsible for this, it is her. Arrest her at once under the charge of defying nobility. Go away! Okay, go! I don't care! I don't care, go! Golly, you think I care? The high bishop pointed a hateful finger at me as he attempted to shift the blame, then coughed up some more blood. He looked between his hand and the spider of blood on the floor. Just look at this. She has attacked me not once, but twice. That is not something she would do without malice. She should bear full responsibility for this, he retort he snarled, spit flying out of his mouth. Bindelwald nodded in agreement, back the high back nodding in agreement, back the high bishop up. Indeed, and she attacked me as well. A mere commoner, clad in blue robes beyond her means. I launched Mana at me, a noble. Out of anyone, this child deserves punishment the most. Bindelwald pointed at me as well, then let as out his disgusting, croaky laugh. It was the same noble logic that Shikikosa had used. No commerce should ever, ever defy a noble. Now then, High Priest, capture mine, and surely she has cannot use her mana, the High Bishop demanded. The High Priest gave a sigh before walking toward me. Dad squeezed my hand tightly as we watched him slowly approach, and I squeezed his back. I see that you let your manas rampage again, mine. There were extenuating circumstances. So it seems. The High Priest murmured as he looked down at me, his eyes sad and full of sympathy. More than anything... That showed that he wouldn't be able to protect me. High Priest, will I be punished for this? You did attack the High Bishop and an outsider noble, after all. I imagine that you, your family, and all your attendants will be executed. I'm sorry, Dad, I said while looking up at him. Dad had let out a short laugh. I was prepared to die back when you first entered the temple, and I'm prepared to die now. Don't let sweat it. But I couldn't help but panic. If only I had gone all out with my mana and killed both the High Bishop and that toad before the High Priest had come out. That would have gotten rid of all the evidence, I said jokingly with a shrug. The high priest nodded, a brief flash of pain on his face. Unfortunately, since you are both incompetent and incapable of properly finishing a job, it is too late for you to hide evidence now. The high priest was the most reliable out of the nobles I knew, and even he said he couldn't save me. It was hard to think of anybody else who would be able to help. In the end, Brother Sylvester's charm didn't help at all. I guess you can never trust a man who says they'll help you. I sighed as I pulled out the chain necklace charm from behind my ropes. There was still a golden flame, fire swaying beneath the black stone, but that was all. Just like Bindelwald and the High Bishop had said, I would be executed for divine nobles as a mere commoner. Brother Sylvester, you liar, I thought to myself while looking at the necklace. The High Priest bent down to look at it. He stared at the stone for a split second, then for a solid second, then widened his eyes in disbelief. Mine, where did you get this? Brother Sylvester gave it to me as thanks for letting him go on a fun hunting trip in the lower city's forest. He said it's a charm. I see, that is quite the charm, I must say. It will make things a lot easier, the High Priest said. His flat expression is now replaced with a slight smile. Apparently the charm was so powerful that the high priest was confident he would be able to send both the high bishop and Bindel while packing. I'm sorry for doubting you and calling you a liar, Brother Sylvester. As I internally thanked Sylvester, the high priest slowly looked between Dad and I. However, it will only be of use if you are prepared to steal your resolve. I looked up at him. If there was a way to save my family and attendants, all, of those, all those who had supported me up until now, then I was willing to do whatever it took. Steal my resolve for what? Being adopted. By Lord Cardstat? If so, I've already... Before I could finish my sentence, the high priest shook his head to interrupt me. Not Cardstat. Sylvester. My future adoptive father wouldn't be the reliable Cardstat, but the unpredictable man-child, Sylvester. I thought was so surprising that all I could do was look at the high priest, my eyes wide and jaw dropped. For a second, I thought he was joking, but his golden eyes were deadly serious. Sylvester's adopted daughter? He was the kind of person to start poking my cheek on our first meeting and demand I cheat chirp pooey. 
but I had met him enough times to know that he wasn't a bad person, not to mention Sylvester had given me this charm because he wanted to protect me. If he actually could save both my family and my attendants, I wouldn't mind becoming his adopted daughter. I'm ready. If it means saving everyone, I'll do it right away. Mine? Dad yelled with wide eyes, but I shook my head. Sorry, Dad, but I want to protect everyone. I hope you can forgive me. That is all I needed to hear, the high priest said, dropping a ring with a yellow stone slotted into it onto my palm. The stone was much larger and more transparent than the face stone of the evidence ring that I had just broken. I could tell at a glance that it was much higher in quality. Mine, pray to win for protection. Pray to protect what you care about from my mana. From your mana, high priest? I asked while looking up and he flashed me an evil grin unlike any I had ever seen him make before. Yes, if that door over there is opened and mana spills out everywhere, it would be quite a pain to fix everything. Make a shield of wind around the door to stop that from happening. We now have justice on our side, mine. It is best we use this opportunity to eliminate those who oppose us. Apparently, the high priest had been extremely frustrated with the situation the high bishop and the toad had put him in. I don't know exa what exactly had put justice on her side, but either way, he turned his back to me with an amused grin on his face before walking toward the both of them. High priest, have you stealed mine's mana? The high bishop asked while peering my way. I gave her a magic tool, the high priest replied smoothly. The magic tool he had given me was for wielding mana, not stealing it, but the high bishop interrupted interpreted that reply in the way that favored him the most. The tension drained from his crushing body, and he gave a cocky grin. Very good. I believe it is best that we entrust this dangerous criminal to Ehrenbach and allow them to remove her from this duchy. The high priest summoned his wand with a sly smile, as if mocking the high bishop for acting like his usual arrogant self. He then aimed his wand at him. It was a clear threat. Well, what are you? The high priest chanted something as he swung his wand, which made beams of light shoot out from its tip and wrap around the high bishop. He fell to the ground like a lifeless stall, then began gnashing his teeth. High priest, what is the meaning of this? It would be inconvenient for you to die here. That is all. Die? replied the high bishop, stunned by the sudden violent word. The high priest turned his back on him and faced Bindewald, who was pointing at the high bit pointing at the high priest's shining wand with clear panic in his eyes. Why does a mere priest have one of those? Because I am a noble who graduated from the Royal Academy, of course. Apparently the shining wand was proof of having graduated from the academy, something that a priest who had been raised in the temple would never be expected to have. It wasn't something that nobles from other duchies would know, but the high priest hadn't been raised in the temple. He was a noble of high enough status that when outside the temple, the commander of the knights captain would bend the knee to him. Shall we duel, Count Bindewald? Why do you know my name? How could I forget the name of the outsider noble who tried entering the city without the archduke's permission, only to be stopped by the knight's order? The high priest knew everything about the incident, including Bindewald's name and circumstances. As always, I couldn't help but be impressed by his diligence. It was good to have him as an ally. Oh, you don't know the half of it, girl, I'm betting. You may think that you will be safe as long as you escape this duchy, but now we have justice on our side. I will not be letting you get away so easily. Justice, you say? I could feel the high priest pouring his mana into his wand. Bindewald must have as well, since he started, stopped staring and hurriedly readied his own. The high priest was pouring such an immense amount of mana into his wand that I couldn't help but gasp. It dwarfed the pittance of mana that the toad had used b using before. Dad, hurry and carry Sir Daniel to the door where Fran is, I shouted. Then dashed over to Fran myself. He winced and tried to stand up as I got closer. Don't move, just sit still. I hadn't been able to tell from afar, but Fran was covered in tiny cuts and bruises. I'm sorry, Fran, are you okay? I am the one who should apologize. I was barely able to help you at all. There was no way that a great priest, untrained in battle and taught from and taught from birth that violence was wrong, would be used in situations like this. It was my fault for getting him wrapped up in this from the first place. Don't be so hard on yourself. You managed to get a few cuts in without getting in my way. You've got good eyes on you. With some proper training, you'd make a good fighter. Dad assured Fran as he carried Daniel to the door. I stepped forward protectively so that they could all be behind me, then began praying while I poured mana into my ring. O goddess of wind, Shitsaria, protector of all. O twelve goddesses who serve by her side. I envisioned the shield surrounding both us in the door as I continued. Please hear my prayer and lend me your divine strength. Grant me your shield of wind so that I might blow away those who mean ill will. With a sharp metallic sound, a shield of wind appeared in the air. Mine, Dad murmured, having never seen me use magic before. I kept my back to him and continued pouring mana into the shield of wind. I will protect them no matter what. The high priest and Bindewald were still just pouring mana into their wands without firing any shots, but that alone was enough to cause sparks to fly in the air all around them. One hit the shield of wind and popped in a tiny explosion. It's okay, I'll protect you all. The swelling mana was in fact crushing in effort, in effect crushing everything around them. Oh, no protection, the high bishop and his attendants lay on the ground, trembling as sparks flew around them. In the midst of all that, Dal Delius frantically began looking around for safety. Dirk held tightly in her arms. Upon seeing my shield of wind, she stood up in wavering legs. 
Please, Sister Mine, help! Please save Dirk! She screamed in desperation. But I had my hands completely full, pouring mana into my ring's face stone to maintain the Shield of Wind and hold back the immense amount of mana radiating from the High Priest and Bindelwald. Protecting Dan if Dad, Fran, and the unconscious Daniel was my priority. I didn't have the leeway to go and help Delia and Dirk. Come into the shield yourself if you want to be safe. I can't move. Delia leaned forward to protect Dirk from the flying sparks, desperately dodging the crushing waves as she made her way over. Her footsteps were heavy as though she was being pushed toward the ground. Sister mine, you were going to help Delia? Fran asked reproachfully. I shook my head. I don't have the leeway to help her, but if she wants to get inside the shield herself, she's free to do so. But Frank... <laughs> Fran continued before trailing off dissatisfied. I lowered my eyes. I could understand his disapproval, and I did remember that he had told me to cut Delia off entirely, but I didn't think it was right to leave them to face the mana out there and let them die together. Dirk in particular was already on the verge of death, having been forced into a contract and then forcibly drained of mana. He wasn't at fault here. Once I explained this to Fran, he swallowed his reproach, but there was still a pained look in his face. All I did was whisper, please don't let her exploit you. Delia inched her way into the shield and collapsed in exhaustion, but not even that was enough for her to let go of Dirk. As she sat with him in her arms, she looked up at me, her crimson hair fluttering behind her. Thank you ever so much, sister mine. Delia, I will allow you inside the shield because I do not wish for either of you to die, but that does not mean I have forgiven, forgotten what you did. Please be aware of that. Of course. The High Bishop's attendant saw that and seemed to think that even if I weren't, wouldn't forgive them, I would at least spare their lives. Sister mine, will we, we please enter as well, they said, each trudging over and wanting to enter the shield too. If you can enter, then certainly. We thank you, but of the three who tried to enter the shield of wind, only one was successful. The other two were blown back by the wind. No! Delia and the shrine made it inside the shield both blinked as they watched the other two get blown away. But why? Those with ill intent can't pass the shield. It wasn't my fault they had been blown away. The shield fundamentally wouldn't allow passage to anyone who meant harm to those within it. Those two shrine maidens had intended to harm either me for hitting the High Bishop of Mana, Dad for hitting, hitting their fellow shrine maiden, Jenny, or Delia and Dirk possibly for entering the shield first. I wasn't enough of a saint to try to save people who meant me or those close to me harm, know that I ha nor did I have the time to care. It's a shame they couldn't, went, they couldn't enter, but that's all there is to it, I murmured right as the High Priest spoke the words, his mana swelling immensely. Just as everything was about to explode, the door behind us creaked open. Kept you waiting, huh, mine? Sylvester said with a grin as he and Karsta stepped out, just as Mana shot out of the high priest in Bindelwald's wands. What the heck is going on? He yelped. Both of you get inside the shield, and please shut the door, I yelled. I watched two enormous beams of Mana collide in front of my eyes. Here we go. Now I gotta fi I'm gonna have to end this here. I'll see y'all next time.